Coming up now on Michael Corrin Life, to grant or not to grant. You pay a lot of money in taxes, you work hard. Do you want that to go to theatre and movie and the such like? Hmm, that's on Michael Corrin Live now. <laughs> Welcome to Michael Corrin Live on Seat a Wonderful Day. The subject tonight, and it's the fun I make that because it's quite a major issue, is arts funding. And by arts, I don't just mean theatre. I mean everything you see in terms of entertainment movies, funding there, books that you read, publishers, museums you go to. So much is funded. Do you agree with that or not? Now, there are many positions in this debate. Some people say... Funding, yes, absolute full funding, lifeblood of Canada. We cannot exist as an independent, autonomous nation without it. Others say the free market will conquer all. I think you know where I stand on that position. Others take a, a middle line. Well, some things should be funded. There are loan systems we could introduce, but maybe we're too indulgent at the moment. Maybe we fund the wrong things. Your opinions, of course, as always, are extremely important. Let me introduce the panel. On my far left, writing, uh, trying to pretend he's an intellectual, is Paul McKeever from the Freedom Party of Ontario. Welcome back to you, sir. Thank you, sir. On my left, Tom Fulton, arts broadcaster. Worked with this man for many years. Wonderful man. I think the best voice on radio. And founder of Toronto Artscape. I have no idea what that is, but we'll find out later. Welcome to you. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> now, what is Toronto Artscape? I it's it's an organization funded uh, or formed to acquire, to renovate, and to make available, safe, affordable studio space for artists in downtown Toronto. See what I mean about the voice? Port on gravel. <laughs> wonderful voice. Larry Sawway, also wonderful voice, different yes, kind. Yes, Broadcast yes. journalist, you all know of him. Good to meet you at last. Yes. And thanks for all these nasty things you keep writing about me in newspapers. Uh, you're I a, try. An I do the best I publicist. can. It's wonderful. I do the best I can. <laughs> and I my, spelled your name right. That is the main thing. On my far right, uh, Meg Beckel, CEO of the Rome Royal Ontario Museum. I have four kids. I have been there I don't know how many times. It's wonderful. Thank you for the work you do. Welcome. Let's begin with you, uh, Paul McKeever. I've been a struggling writer. Now, of course, I'm a... <laughs> you know, on television, but I've been a struggling writer. Grants helped me big time when I was starting out. I make no apologies for taking them. Uh, I then have my books published in, in different countries, different languages. All of the, the money I earn, I pay tax on in this country. I couldn't have written the books without the grants. They helped me. It all worked out properly. I'm not saying fund everyone, but surely we should be funding the arts to some extent in Canada. I think I have to disagree. Uh, of course, that's going to be my position all night, but... Um, That's why you're here. Yeah, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of what we see in the newspapers bandied about by people in the various uh, art interests, uh, a lot of the issues really discussed are w who should decide which paintings to buy, which forms of art to buy. Uh, I think we should first look uh, to the question of should we be buying art at all? I mean, there is the question of should we be spending money on things like uh, police, uh, education, health care, before we spend money on things like art. And there's also the, the more ph philosophical question of, is this something for government to be doing in the first place? If your daughter needs bands on her teeth, would you deny her, her piano lessons in order to make sure she had the bands on her teeth? If there Think was only, about it. If there was only enough money to buy one, yes. Are you serious? You would really do that? I agree. Yes, I, I agree. Health would come first. You but, would really, but, you would really but, 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 honestly Before, make before that Larry kind of becomes choice. too extraordinarily rude, let me ask you <laughs> this. Let's not pretend here. The governments that cut back on arts funding are the same people who cut back on health and welfare and the rest of it. Right. Cutting is cutting. There are very few governments that say, well, you know, we, we really want to increase spending when it comes to the welfare state, but we'll cut back on arts funding. That, that isn't the way it goes. You have a philosophical objection to arts funding. Absolutely. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the reason we give government the power to do what they do, I mean, what do they do? Primarily what they do is they come to us and they say, give us some money. Mm -hmm. 
and if you don't give us some money, we'll throw you in jail or we'll but find you. Tell me why you if I could just finish, though, why, why uh, the reason they the reason they do this is because we consent to a certain amount of robbery so that we can protect ourselves, our property, well, etc. You mean taxation? Exactly. It's not robbery when we consent to it. That's the essential difference. Mm -hmm. But when government grows to the point where it's robbing to do things like finance hockey teams, bail out banks, and yeah, and yes, finance. Uh, you know, actually subsidize primarily the wealthy who want to see opera, uh, I think we start to have to question um, whether or not this is an appropriate role for government at all. Okay, they didn't bail out hockey teams, thank goodness. They bailed out banks and that was a travesty, I agree with you. And certainly there is a class issue here in that uh, government tends to not question the funding of, uh, of more hybrid entertainment. However, there is a strong argument to be made that without funding opera, ballet, mainstream theatre, Stratford, Niagara that are, are pretty mainstream and many other things simply wouldn't be here. Books written by Canadians that are very good that turn out to be international bestsellers wouldn't have been published or even written without grants. It, it's, it's not just the, the, the caricature of funding so millionaires can go and watch uh, fat ladies singing. There's more, much more to it than that. Oh, I agree. I, I, I don't mean to say that it's simply a subsidy on the, uh, you know, for the wealthy. But sh uh, surely it has to be recognized as a subsidy for a small class of people who are actually interested in these various arts. I mean, if we, if we want to look at uh, contributions that could, you know, for example, be financially successful, wouldn't we put our money into things like professional wrestling or the CFL? I mean, and, and certainly we could get just as much pride out of a, uh, out of a, f a subsidized CFL as we could out of uh, a healthy art. Uh, Let me ask culture. you a question. How do you feel about public libraries? Should they exist or should only people who can afford to go out and buy books buy them? Simple well, question. Yeah, I think people who can afford to buy them should buy them and people who can't afford to buy them should just be illiterate. No, I think that just as they, they did at the turn of the century, there'd be We're Carnegie We're not living at the turn of the century. We aren't. The turn of which century? We're living at the turn of a new century. Right. Do you want to go back to Charles Dickens? You want to go back to poor houses? You want to go back to child labor? You want to go back well, to bread and water? What I, are you talking ironically, about? Ironically, there's the a certain century? paradox in what you say, because yeah, the yeah. point is we haven't developed a Charles Dickens since Charles Dickens. We've developed a lot of bloody awful writers. We haven't developed Charles Dickens. Well, that's one man's opinion. There's, well, I think, one I, man's opinion. I think it's a pretty strong one opinion. opinion. There, I, I suppose you'd be for, for Paradise Libraries. I don't want to go down the library route yet, but sure. I, look, there is incredible abuse when it comes to I, I declare my position here. That, 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 let's be quite explicit about this. I've received grants, not in many, many years. Uh, I don't. I still like them, but I don't think it would be appropriate for me to do it now, but I did in the beginning. There's corruption when it comes to grant giving, certainly in, in the literary area. If you know the right person, you'll get a grant. If your politics aren't right, you won't get the grant. Uh, there you're just okay, saying uh, things. I mean, you're Larry, making these dogmatic Larry, statements with nothing to back it up. Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to... Like saying I, we have I don't want to, I don't want to query your use of language. No, what no, is no, dogmatic no. about stating no, no, an anecdote? No, no, no. An anecdote can't be dogmatic by its very nature, but if I may, probably I know that because I received a grant. However, I can give you examples. I'm not going to do it on the air because I don't want to get us involved in a lawsuit, but I'm quite happy to do that. How, having said all that, I believe in a loan system where if someone can show they're going to write a book that is worthwhile, there could be a loan to help them in the early days, an interest-free loan. I believe that a certain number of grants to people to help them, I think that's entirely appropriate. So aren't we in danger here of, of either one side you fund everything and it all works perfectly, which is nonsense, or the other point of view is never give a, a grant to anyone. I, I can think of a dozen books, a dozen books right now that are pretty good, published in this country in the past five years that wouldn't have been published without a grant. But you say that doesn't matter? Uh, yeah, I do, because there are a lot of books out there that didn't get grants that similarly will never be read by the, by the public. As you say, there is some corruption, there is some uh, inside way of knowing who's going to get it and who's not. I mean, if you look at the arguments, uh, I, I had an, uh, an article here by... Uh, uh, sorry, Shirley Thompson, who recently said basically you need Canada Council to decide on art because if you leave it to the wealthy, you'll end up with muddled collections. Well, the interesting thing is that she was buying uh, paintings in the range of one to three million dollars. Now, they couldn't have been that price unless the Canada Council is thinking along the exact same lines artistically as the so called wealthy who have no talent. So, uh, you know, pure market demand. Otherwise, I mean, if they were more honed in on, on the value, the intrinsic value of art rather than the monetary value, you wouldn't expect uh, their paintings to be necessarily three or one million dollars. I have no time for people who depend 
totally on grants. I have enormous time for people who will go to the private and the public sectors to fund what they're doing. There are certainly, and I know of them, too many people who don't even try to get people to come in and see their artworks or read their magazine. They just keep taking the grant. I've known of publishers, and again, we can give names in the break if you like, who have said, unless we uh, publish another manuscript this year, we'll lose some of our grant, and they pick something from the pile. They are not the norm. Would you acknowledge the Royal Ontario Museum is a very fine museum and incredibly necessary for the city of Toronto? Uh, I would say that it's as necessary as the dollars prove it is necessary. Uh, if, is there if, nothing other than dollars? I mean, my, my, my four kids say the ROM is marvelous. Without it, their lives I, I agree. It's, would it's be diminished. Wonderful, it's a wonderful place, and I think that if it, if it deserves to continue to exist, if it's really as helpful to all of society as it's built to be, and I think it probably is, then it, it can simply adjust uh, its, its costs and or its uh, revenues to, to suit the market. Now, if the right. market isn't there, then it shouldn't exist. Okay, I, well, well, you all get a chance, but I have to say this. So if, if it's financially viable, right. it's acceptable. Absolutely. So pornography is acceptable? Yes. Okay. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131. Porn is okay. Uh, Picasso could barely make a living in his early years. Michael Curran, live CTS, back in a moment. Welcome back. I was drinking water there. <laughs> Welcome back to Michael Corrin Live on CDS. We're talking about arts funding, which is a huge argument because it really is about more than the arts. It's about how we view life. If something is financially viable, does that mean it is acceptable? We should aspire to it. I, I say no. I think money should really be one of the, the, uh, the lesser of our considerations. Some things will make money. Junk food, pornography, dramatized wrestling. It doesn't mean we should aspire to these things. Some things probably won't make money great art, compassion, community. But I think we should aspire to these. Arts funding, I believe there is a middle way. I think there is abuse at the moment. I think there's also underfunding in certain areas. Meg Beckel, CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum, used by, I don't know how many people come through the doors. You probably know how many people come through the doors every year. But I know as a, uh, someone who lives in Toronto with a family, we go, we've been members most of the time. We, we must renew. We use it all of the time. I can tell you where everything is as much as you can, I think. <laughs> well, one thing about the whole issue about funding of the arts, it's, it's more than just about funding individual ar artists. It's also about funding the organizations that help the individual artists on one side, but also provide a service to society that society has demonstrated is valuable to them. We have 1.5 million people per year that participate in what the ROM has to offer in some way. 700,000 people walk through our door. They're voting with their feet in terms of the fact that they do value the ROM and the service it provides. Mm -hmm. uh, the collections that we have, the research we do, the public programs we offer, the exhibits we show. We also have 400,000 people a year who participate in our outreach exhibits throughout Ontario. Another 400,000 people I engage in the interactive exhibits on our website. That's 1.5 million a year and it's not the same 1.5 million every year. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, given the government subsidy that we get from the province of Ontario, which is just over 18 million. What is it, the total cost of running the ROM? $30 million. So a little over half comes from the government. That's right, it's about 58% comes from government. Now that's mm -hmm. down from 74% from government 10 years ago. So the equation is changing. Certainly there are pressures on all of the arts organizations to increase its, their financial self-sufficiency and so we're looking at ways to improve our financial self-sufficiency, our retail shops, our food and beverage activities, renting out the facility is very popular now. So there are ways that you can generate revenues which also enhance the experience for the visitors to the institution. But not everybody has those opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, the ROM has those, but there's a limit to what you can do before you affect the, what the visitor expects from a museum. Do we know how many, roughly, of the people who go to the ROM every year are from Toronto? How many are Canadian? How many are from abroad? We have that breakdown. Off the top of my head, I yeah. don't have it. But I assume it's a sizable amount who are spending money from outside of the city, the province, or the country. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When, when we look at our general breakdown, and if you define a tourist as someone who drives at least two hours mm -hmm. to visit the ROM, of the 700,000 people, on average, 
30 percent of our visitors are from the GTA. The balance would be tourists. Of those, uh, probably it's an even split between those that are outside of the province and those that are um, in the surrounding areas of Ontario. You're also spending their money Absolutely. in other places. Absolutely. And so there are many other benefits. You look at our major exhibition coming up, Egyptian Art in the Age of the Pyramids. Yeah. We have relationships with 10 hotel partners right now, and so they're all benefiting from the traffic that we're going to be pulling into the city during a shoulder season. This is a slow season for, for hotels, for restaurants. We're adding value in that way. So you look at the economic impact of a major exhibition like Egyptian art, it's significant. And it's, it's a program that will be of interest to all audiences, not only the connoisseur interested in the, uh, the major show, but also the family programming that we're providing as an add-on. And so we are appealing to many different audiences from basically all over the world. Okay. The planetarium yes. there, that was closed down. Yes, it was. Is there another one in Toronto now? I'm not aware of one. I'm not aware of one. There was, isn't another formal planetarium. Right. Was we that have, for financial reasons? You that was financial reasons. We uh, had a cut to our, our yeah. grant, uh, close to $2 million, and we're forced to make a very difficult decision yeah. on what program would we eliminate. Yeah. And uh, that was the program okay. that we selected at the time. All right, Tom Fulton. Um, my children, at least two of them, went to the planetarium, which is a wonderful experience for any kid to have. The other two can't because there's no longer one in Toronto. Um, a two million cut in grants. We know the amount of money government uh, gets rid of in waste. It's not a lot of money. Surely the funding of something like the How can anyone argue against the funding of something like the ROM? Well, I don't think anyone can really argue against I keep, keep going through my head is that we've got this billion dollars that goes into the CBC. How many planetariums could that fund? You know, I, I agree, know that's I agree, another issue. I, but, no, no, I agree there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but why should it be the government or a government agency that has to fund it? I mean, if they had the capital, if, if, if we were rolling in the, that kind of money, sure. Or they could, what is that term Jackman used? Incent. If they could incent... Uh, somehow give some incentive to people. He's been talking to Comrade Black, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> but couldn't private donors, and it doesn't have to be a couple of people ponying up millions and millions of dollars. It can be you buy a $25 share in the planetarium, or maybe you get a lifetime membership for $500 but or they've something. Tri they've tried that. I mean, surely you, you've tried all those things. We have tried it, and there's, there's a limit to how much of your operating budget is going to end up being subsidized through private support, whether it's individual support or corporate support. And eventually, um, if we want to provide the quality of service and the range of services and programs, for example, if we want to maintain our school visit program, that's a program that has a cost associated with it and it's subsidized through our grant. If we were to charge full fare, we would have to double, perhaps triple, the amount we charge each student that comes through the door and benefits from that program. And right now, because we cater to all ages, it would affect all ages in the school system. So the question then becomes, without the subsidy, we're forced to charge the full cost of admission, which then limits access to that service. And so who is best to make that kind of decision? I mean, it's, in, in it's a question. In terms of the planetarium, though, mm -hmm. has there been a, how many t years has it been closed now? A year and it was a half closed since 96. 96? Has, is there still a large outcry, people on a daily basis or weekly no. basis saying, why don't we open it up? So, so maybe it was, you know, an idea whose time hadn't fully ripened. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. When you when you talk about economic impact, and that, I mean, I think that argument's a little bit suspicious. I don't know if it, if it really pans out because if I look at the imp economic impact of a hockey game, or WrestleMania, or the car show, I'll probably find that the economic impact is that much greater. Uh, I mean, those things are profitable in and no, of no, themselves. No, 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 wait. I suggest that probably you should take a good long look at what the Canada Council did. It's seminal investigation of rub off within the community. Um, what the arts do, and more people go to art galleries and museums than go to hockey games in Canada. Did you know that? On a given day... Did you know that? I didn't have that data. All right. <laughs> I, Larry, is, I, the rumbling, the explosion is about to happen, yeah. so we'll take a break. The lines are very busy. Andrea and Laura and Harold and Rob and Jerry and the rest of you. 416-203-0302 and 905-332-3131. On Michael Corrin Live, back in 2.34 moments with no subsidy. 
for now. Welcome back to Michael Curran Live on CTS. We're talking about funding here, and um, just before we, we let Larry Solway loose, <laughs> just a couple of points. The, Try the, to stop me. I, I'm trying to take a middle road here. I really believe there's an argument for funding, certainly for things like museums and theatres and publishing. I believe some of the money is wasted. My real problem is you have to fund things that at least some people are interested in. I've personally gone to art galleries in Toronto where if you do go in, they wonder what you're doing there. Now, I'm not saying these are typical, but we're talking about $130,000 a year, three galleries between $105,000 and $135,000. It's not a huge amount of money, but it's fairly large. You can I'd rather see that money go to places where it's needed. Um, if they're a, a group of black kids who are putting a theatre group together, you think they're going to get funding from the banks? I think it's a good thing to say, we will help you out, but show us that you can do it. If after three or four years, it ain't happening, it's not just a free ride. There are magazines like that. There are, there are publishers like that. There are others who've taken the money and invested, done well, and they've blossomed, and that is a good thing. Look at this TV station. There's no public funding here. We don't take anything from anyone. M many other TV stations do. We applied year after year to get a TV license. We were turned down, we were turned down. Finally, we were given one. The station's going well. This show is getting very large numbers, far more than on uh, most other shows that you read about in the paper all the time that getting public funding. It is unfair. It's unfair that I have to pay tax dollars to fund an advertising campaign for the CBC or the TVO that's probably a, a, a bigger budget than we have for the total show. And they're, they're trying to put me out of a job. There's something wrong there, but there is a middle road, surely. Larry Solway, oh. go. Oh, my. Look, I'm not going to indulge in the kind of mindless hyperbole that I hear so much of around here. Congratulations for this station. I'm glad you've made it. I think that's wonderful. I don't feel that anybody's trying to take away anybody's job, but I don't want to be sucked into that argument. The real point is, and I agree with you, I agree, as you say, arts, that is, the dance, music, uh, uh, Art Can't galleries, give them. museums, <laughs> whatever it happens to be, theater, ballet, they need help. They cannot be, by their very nature, they cannot be self-sustaining. The point I made, and one of, the, one of the reasons I'm here is your people read a letter I wrote to the Globe and Mail. Mm -hmm. It was in response to an article written by Peggy Atwood where she said, uh, that people all hate Toronto. Toronto is the that, sort Margaret of Atwood to Margaret Atwood like us. is the is it, it's sort of the artsy fartsy center of the country, and everybody loves to hate Toronto. What I said was, it is part of the anti-intellectualism that is so rampant in this country that says we don't want to promote things for. And I heard one open line broadcaster say, if not you, for the brie and white wine set. <laughs> you know, in other words, they're all thrown away. For the rich people who go to operas. Primarily. I guess you have never been to Italy. Well, this is We're not in Italy, are we? It doesn't <laughs> matter. The fact is, do you know any Italian Canadians who are barbers or shoemakers or bricklayers who love opera? They can't afford to go. Not personally, but... Well, I'm telling you, they exist. A lot of them I'm like baseball. You, a lot I'm, of them like baseball and WrestleMania yeah, and hockey games. that's not the point. And, baseball, that's, and that obviously is where they're spending their look, money. The point is that baseball and WrestleMania and any of those things have the benefit of not only ticket sales. They have the benefit of television. They have the benefit of all kinds of downstream stuff. They have all kinds of additional ancillary benefits built in. You know that we couldn't have Major League Baseball without television. Well, can we have? The Royal Ontario Museum televised? Certainly not. We can have dance because, because it's not as popular as baseball. We can have dance because opera it and can't theater do anything. Televised. What are we going to have? Full contact museum going? <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? <laughs> I like what are the we sound. Do? Of that. that might be an idea. Yeah, like maybe some people would come out. Pads and go, <laughs> and go running. Yes, people would come out. What does that mean? There's a famous sculptor named Serra, who's an American of, of, of Spanish who created a wall, which a lot of people didn't like, it was outside a government building in New York. 
And the people in the building said they didn't like it. It was a piece of abstract art. Whether you like abstract art or not, it exists. It has merit. He went to a meeting to discuss this, and he said, you know, if people were voting for pinball or Beethoven, there would be no Beethoven. That's correct. Oh, hold on a minute. Uh, that is absolutely not correct. First of all, I mean, because something that exists, is absolutely if I may correct. respond, the existence of something does not imply merit. Many think Hitler existed. It didn't imply no, merit. No, 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 no. no. Let's I mean, talk about... How can you indulge in such foolishness? I'm sorry I'm a but fool of mine, but I'll just have to... No, no, I'll, I'll I just have to. I didn't I'll just call have to try my best. I let didn't me, call you a fool. I said me, that was foolishness. Let me give you some There's examples nothing to do with of Hitler. funding. Please let's, don't invoke let me, Hitler. Let me give you some examples of public oh, funding. Let's say a gallery on Queen Street West that is funded $130,000 a year that has amongst its exhibits 150 drawings by children of a man's penis, um, a rack for sadomasochism, a photograph of a woman uh, pulling a scroll between her legs, she's naked, and next to it in a plastic booth, the scroll covered in dried menstrual blood. Have you no, let, me, let me finish, please, sorry, let me finish. You haven't because enough galleries, obviously. I don't know where it is Larry, you're why, going. Why, why, do you, why do you have to imply that people disagree with you, they're stupid? No, 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 no. I, But that's you, what you've done to I Paul did and not to me. Use, I did not use the word stupid, you used the oh, word stupid. I did not use the word fool, you Larry, used the word fool. Please, don't put words Screaming, screaming does not imply and you truth know. And, and knowledge. Let and me finish. You ought to know this that. is a gallery that gets $130,000 of yes. public funding. Mm -hmm. I said to the person at the door, How many people will come in? She said, Well, actually, I'm very surprised. Joy. Very few people come along. I go to a gallery next door, $120,000. I mean, about five of them in the same proximity. $120,000, $125,000 of public funding. I go in there, and, and there's a little uh, alcove. And I go into the room, and there's a woman watching a video. May I come in? And she said, Well, I'm not comfortable with that, which is how these people speak. Well, I am, I said. It's publicly funded. I may come in. There's a video of a, a dwarf, or a person of restricted growth, painted white, stabbing a naked woman tied to a tree. This went on for two hours, this movie. Are you saying fund everything and anything? Are you saying just give the money paid by hard-working Canadians to any sort of self-indulgent middle-class garbage out there? Is that what you're oh, saying? Well, that is probably the most loaded question I've ever heard. That's right up there with Hitler. Did you ever see a Maplethorpe exhibit? No, I've seen photographs of Do you of. know about the Maplethorpe exhibit? Do you know yes, that in Larry, Cincinnati? I do. Did you not? Did you see it? No. I did. I haven't got the money I to go to Cincinnati. You, I don't get I, any public funding. Maplethorpe was also in New York. <laughs> even, even more difficult. What are these rhetorical questions Maplethorpe, for? I know of Maplethorpe. I've read about Maplethorpe. I've seen pictures. I didn't go to the, the exhibit. the same objections were voiced about Maplethorpe. Because Maplethorpe is gay, because Maplethorpe likes to take did pictures. I, did I use the word Just gay? Just a moment. Maplethorpe. Did I use the word gay? I don't have a chance. But it's not. You, you're, I you're, really you're don't have a that, chance. You're saying because people I use the word gay. Did I, I use the word gay? I don't have a chance. Maplethorpe is very. We can argue about Maplethorpe, My but heavens. Maplethorpe is. Well, you've 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 What's met you've met you've, you've met you've matched tonight. I haven't. You're people. Just, People like Maplethorpe, and that's up to them. Maplethorpe is commercially viable, in fact. What has it got to do with public funding? You are the one who brought up what you described as obscene pictures, and you went from... Never mentioned the word obscene. I you said went, nobody went there. You went from those depictions yes. to asking me whether or not I thought everything should be funded. In other words, what you're saying to me, who is going to make the decisions about where the money is going Partially, to go? Partially. When Mayor Giuliani wanted to close down the Brooklyn Canada. Art Gallery, yes. same story. No. Well, I don't understand how you can be so selective about it. He what? wanted to close down what was a recognized... No, he didn't. Except... No, he didn't. Holy mackerel. Yes, holy mackerel indeed. I think they were holy. All he said was, is it appropriate for Roman Catholic taxpayers of this city to fund a vehemently, viciously and violently anti-Catholic exhibit? They can exist, but why should these people pay for it? That doesn't seem to be an unreasonable thing to say. He didn't send the police in with bayonets to close it down. All he said was, you know what? Catholics here might be offended by this anti-Catholic stuff. Why should they have to pay to be kicked in the face? I think this is a good point. We're, we're and we have to break up only oh. at that point. Unless you want to respond there, I'll give you the last 10 good seconds. Good grief, no. No? Okay. <laughs> Not a chance. I'm sure you get the chance on the publicly funded channel. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131. On Michael Curran Live, no public funding on CTS. Back in a moment.
Welcome back to Michael Corrin live on the CTS. In the break, we were talking about who wants to be a millionaire. Don't care, it's not on at the same time as I am, so, and I did watch a bit of it tonight. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131. We're talking about funding of the arts. My position, I believe, is a very moderate one. I, I, can, I can feel Larry, I can feel him squirming. I believe it's a very moderate one. I say funding, yes, but don't fund everything. You've got to be selective. And you have to see that people are working. If they can, for example, say, we can get 50% private funding or 20% if you'll give us some help. I say, yeah, let, let, let's meet in the middle. Uh, if a magazine is increasing its circulation gradually, OK, we carry on. There are cases, uh, magazines that go down. They don't even seem to make the effort. You've got to say enough is enough. Uh, the British example, several museums will close down. They were just told, you haven't done the work. We'll give you a year or two years to improve how you respond to the public, advertising campaign, modernization. Many of them transformed. Others, still in the dark ages, the grants were cut off. I just say, selective. Should we go to the Lions? Yeah, let's go to the Lions. Andrea on line one. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Michael. Hello. Hi, I just want to tell you how much I enjoy your show. Thank you. And um, I just want to let you know that I really do agree with um, Larry in, in some respects, but um, what you have to say is, <laughs> is very valid, Michael, in that we have to be a little more selective in who we're going to give our money to. I mean, if we're going to cut out the public libraries, there would be public outcry. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, you know, a museum that has um, exhibits that are maybe not that tasteful or to you or I or the common people, but maybe something like that might be something we should think more closely about giving grants to people. And How would you decide um, yeah. what has merit? What, what, kind of, what kind of yardstick? You've got me. I wouldn't know how to do it. How do you decide? I think you have to take some sort of uh, pool. I think you have to find out what the people want, and you have to go through the masses. You can't just, uh, you know, take what four or five people want when you're looking at millions of people. You but can't. it isn't, you know, what people want. I go back to what the sculptor said. If people voted between pinball and Beethoven, there'd be no Beethoven. You know, I, have, I have to answer to that. You know, if, if there was What's no the base, it, well, if there was no, ba if there, sorry, if there was no pinball, there'd be no pinball wizard, there'd be no Tommy, there'd be no who. And I think a lot of people would be upset about that, too. It's, it's also but, a very <laughs> flawed <laughs> argument. I don't know if it's true. I don't true. want to exclude. It's not, a, it's not a flawed argument. The fact is, this caller asks a very important question. If only what, what is perceived to be a small number of people want something, mm -hmm. should they overrule the majority? Well, in a democracy, very often we pay attention to minority attitudes. We pay attention to the fact that it isn't an overwhelming number of people who want something, but some people do, and that almost of itself has merit. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Well, and I don't think arts is a democracy. First of all, the argument made by the sculptor, um, and please don't shout at me, is a typical patrician argument. If we ask the common people, they would vote for Pimble instead of Beethoven. In fact, I think they'd probably vote for Beethoven. It's just that the chattering classes always assume the stupidity of people who are not like them. More than that, when it comes, for example, to grants in the literary area, there is a jury. And I think that's a good thing to do. You'll have people. There must be more work to make sure the jury do not know the people applying. I think that's a bit of a problem. And we have a fairly small artistic community, so that's going to be difficult. But people to judge. Well, now, what's on the jury? If I, who decides about who's going to be on the jury? I think people who are people, We talk uh, people about have peers. Been, people they should have been, be peers. People have been published. Okay. People are interested in writing. I think you can have people from the community who are simply readers, who apply and say, I'm an avid reader. I would like to be on the jury. Ordinary people. I think, yeah, they should be allowed but, to have an opinion. But, Larry, one last point. The idea somehow that we have these struggling artists who simply want to show a pair of dirty knickers and they've not been allowed to is absolute <laughs> nonsense. The fact is, it's the more orthodox, the more conservative, the more traditional, and the more religious artists, writers, who are the ones who don't get the grants. The others, if they, if they whisper perversion, homosexuality, here's a government grant. And if you think that isn't true, you're living in a false paradise. But I think that's where the well, caller... Well, welcome to paradise. I think that's welcome where the caller's right. I mean, she's what? saying, uh, Larry asked, well, how do you decide? And I think the real question is, who decides? You know, do we have to save people from themselves? Or can we, as the, as the caller said, mm -hmm. let people you know, vote with their feet. I think that's appropriate. Tom, 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 CGRT, we both, I mean, you were the mainstay of CGRT. I think you, you made it what it was, and I did a tiny little bit of that. But we can probably agree, well, I, I would say it's gone downhill. Uh, 
Well, if, you'll get no argument there from me, Michael. Since I left popular, downhill. It's more popular. Is it? Show me the ratings, oh, Larry. Pop Show City me the numbers. No, oh, they got CJLT. sponsors. Oh, it's pop. I, hey, I think, baby. Do, do you mean CJRT? I don't think you do. I listen to CJRT no, all no, the listens. time. Uh, if they would have, their public funding was taken away. They were the first, probably the first yeah. highest profile institution to lose funding when Mike Harris took over the first time. If it would have kept its funding, if you could have stayed there, you were the best thing they had, and I, I mean that. It could have remained a station that really did deal with music that people wanted, that they can't hear now. Surely that's an argument for public funding, and it wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't a lot of money. It was about 40% of the budget. Uh, originally, the government uh, in the 70s funded it to, it had no money at all. Ryerson threw it off, as you probably remember. Mm -hmm. And to support it, the uh, conservative government at that time funded it for a period and said, but we'll fund you, but you have to raise money on your own mm -hmm. also. And we'll have a decreasing funding arrangement. And that's what they did. So it ended up toward the end, it was about 40% of the budget, a little over a million dollars the government cut it. There was a lot of stunned people, I and mean, we were walking through the halls, what's going on, how can we survive? But we did survive, mm -hmm. because we fundraised on the air. There were corporations that ponied up even more money. No, it was if, if the management, if the board, had had the will to continue, they could have remained non-commercial. Yeah. They could have still had new and fresh educational programming on the air. Some of the musical programs weren't necessarily for everyone's taste. Some of it was pretty esoteric, mm -hmm. both in the jazz and, and the classicals. Now it's, well, as Larry says, it's for everybody. It is. It does have a more popular base Wait now. Wait a minute. I want to make one of the great tragedies in the funding of CJRT has always been the fact that even though they're down, as far as the ratings are concerned. No, no, just generally looking at CJRT. The numbers there, they're about 100,000 listeners to CJRT, give or take a few thousand every rating period. Of that 100,000, fewer than 2% of the people who are recorded as listening have ever made a contribution to it. I listen to all these things. I listen to all of them, and they're begging for money. And they're saying, all you people who are listening you're listening, you like it, and you tape what we send out too, which means you cheat the record companies, and you won't send us any money. Well, here's, this a, is here's, a, here's a good lesson. When people say, please phone in and give money, or we'll vanish, phone in and give money, or it'll vanish. But That's what 98% of the listeners don't send in money. Well, then you have to question the, the wisdom, then, of, of engaging in a venture but where you listening. give away things for free but and hope that people pay. But they're listening. Wouldn't you love to see Peter Mansbridge <laughs> and others begging for money on television to keep the CBC going? And I tell you what, well, that, could do a good job. let's not go down there. 416 2030302905332 Harold, Rob, Cameron, Jason, Jerry, and the rest of you, we'll get to you as soon as we come back. I can see you. So don't go away. Michael Curran live on CTS, of course. Cameron live on CTS, straight to the lines. They are busy. Cameron on line, I think that's six. No, it's eight. Cameron on line eight. Hi there, Cameron. Hi. How are you, Michael? Doing well, thank you. I have a brief story I'd like to get comments from the panel on. There's an Ontario city of half a million where I used to live. Less than that, a quarter million. And they gave up the city gallery to make way to a uh, casino, which was going to be for a temporary period which was fine, everything worked out fine. In the meantime, the, uh, the uh, gallery was located for a brief period, hopefully, or a few years, in a suburb where there was a major uh, <clears throat> uh, shopping center, the major one in the, in the outskirts of the city, practically, which gathered a lot more people than the downtown shops. The gallery, when it was downtown, serviced basically the office people in the downtown area. But the, the population center, that population that moved around was out in the shopping malls. Well, anyway, this, when the gallery moved to that shopping mall, the gallery attendants shot up, naturally, because 
the people were there. That's where the people were. They weren't downtown. So when the time came to relocate the uh, gallery in a permanent place, I had commented to some of the important people in the gallery, well, that's great. I think you should stay out there. And the reaction was, oh, no, no, no. We don't get the right people there. Well, I said, everybody I know, all the people I know who have homes, they hang paintings. Now, the taste... Where, where was this? this? Windsor, are you talking Windsor, about? Yeah. Hmm? Are you talking about Windsor? It could be. Oh, well, don't be coy. Are we talking about Windsor? What's that? Okay, thanks for the call, Cameron. I, I, honestly, I don't think the, the burghers of Windsor will come round to slaughter you if you say the name, but um, I, I think it's obviously Windsor. What he's implying there is that uh, people who run art galleries are not actually interested in people, they're interested in the right kind of people. Look, you know that the principle of locating something as urbane as an art gallery downtown is to maintain the character of the downtown. And it's true that every time we move an institution from downtown, we hollow out the city. And Windsor is in the process of getting to be like Detroit. It's being hollowed out. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be the reality may be, and I accept it, that more people go who live in the suburbs, and maybe that's where it should be. But that's what's happening. There's been that move away yep. from the core of the city. It's certainly regrettable. Um, I interrupted you when you were going to make a point before the break. I've just remembered. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, a point that I wanted to make generally is that many arts organizations also serve an education role. Mm -hmm. And when you think about art, it's not just about art for art's sake. Many of the institutions provide special programs for all kinds of schools throughout Ontario. And it's not just museums and galleries. Uh, the ballet has a school visit program. The opera has a school visit program. Uh, Symphony has a school visit program. And so this is one of the many uh, programs that ensure that they reach out into the community mm -hmm. um, in a way that's affordable for everyone. And many of these programs are either subsidized by their base grant or they're subsidized through corporate sponsorship. Um, so it's not just about pulling people into the, into the building to see the core product, it's also about education. And so um, comment about, well, certainly subsidizing education is okay, but not art. Well, art well, serves I, I, I an educational that. role. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would never say that subsidizing education is all right, but art is, uh, subsidizing art is not. I, I think, uh, frankly, we need uh, to let people decide on their schooling just as much as they need to decide on their entertainment. But um, your point there about education, if, it, if assuming we're, we're going to still have, as we always pr probably will, a public education system, if the true purpose uh, is educational and the funds are used primarily to subsidize students attending, why not subsidize those students by putting it through the education budget rather than through the, ed uh, the arts budget, for example? Let's take another call. Jason on line two. Hi, Jason. Hi, Michael. Hi. I just wanted to let you know that I certainly appreciate the Alfred Hitchcockian profile that's part of your montage before we Thank come. Thank you. And you know what? He was born in Leytonstone, which is uh, where I used to live for the first five years of my life. Wonderful. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to say that um, I love your show, but uh, tonight I was a little bit un unimpressed with some of the ways that Larry has been carrying on. Um, in, in that I, I, just, I just don't quite align to everything you're saying, sir. I do agree that the arts need funding. I don't think that people who think that some funding should be cut are necessarily, in your words, uh, Philistines, uh, which, by the way, is a very derogatory comment, which I was not impressed with. The other thing was that um, Robertson Davies uh, has said very clearly during his career, which is probably one of the biggest and strongest exports we have from our region here, that uh, funding for the arts should be cut off altogether. Uh, he believes that if an artist can't make their merit, in the marketplace, then they shouldn't be there. At the same time, Mr. Davies was also criticized for his writing being so complex and intellectual that it couldn't be approached by people who had not cleared high school and possibly even a university degree. And he they made no bones about the fact that that type of um, uh, problem in his art occurs, but that it's perfectly fine for people who are unable to appreciate it to simply not buy it. No, I, wouldn't, I, I, I won't argue with you, but I think one point ought to be made in passing, that the Davies family, including Robertson, had a piss pot, excuse me, a lot of money. 
the Kingston Whig Standard, the Peterborough Examiner, things like that, you know. They were very well healed, and when you've got that kind of money, you can afford almost to be a dilettante. He wasn't. He was a great novelist. Yes, and I agree with you. And, 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 and so I'm actually standing a little bit further uh, left of Michael's position in that I believe that we do need to keep a great deal of funding in place. However, I do also agree with Michael and Mr. Solway. This is true. It's been documented and studied by Christian organizations and by nonpartisan organizations that if you mention the word lesbian or gay or any type of perversion or any type of uh, thing that's against the family or against the structure of society which holds this country together, that you will get funding. Much more likely, as a matter of fact, a women's group that was trying to do some uh, funding for an artistic program toward how to keep uh, uh, families and wives and, uh, and husbands and wives moving in a positive direction and a Christian focus were denied funding. They left, the, like, they left their um, application exactly as it stood and reworded it to be lesbians, and immediately they got the funding, even though the program that they were, that they were uh, posing was wrong. And I'd be happy, Michael, to send you a copy of that if you so request it. Well, Jason, I, I am aware of that. It is, this is, it's not so much about uh, strategy as tactics. Certainly there are problems within the way grants are given. There's another example of a very fine publication called the Chesterton Review. Uh, the, the magazine, or no, the, the journal dedicated to G.K. Chesterton, the great British writer, comes out of Saskatoon. And that's a wonderful thing, that you know, Prairie College should produce this world-renowned magazine. Um, very, very highly regarded. Could they get a grant? No. Um, and it was written down, there are Catholic priests behind this. That was actually written down in the refusal of the grant. When you become so biased, uh, so one-sided, it's almost vulgar. It's so obvious. That's part of the problem in the way grants are given. But uh, that doesn't answer the argument about whether we should grant or not. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131. We'll get to Dina and Jerry and Bill and Tom and all the rest of you on Michael Curran Live on CTS, and we come back in just 2.34 moments from now. Michael Corrin, live on CTS, talking about arts funding, Dina on line one. Hi, Dina. Hi, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. I'm just catching your show here before I actually go out to do a show myself. Oh, what do you do? I'm a professional magician. Are you? Mm, yes. I've, ta I've taken up magic, you know. Really? Yeah. Oh, well, you do kind of look like somebody That's that is. He's going to grow hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you Where do you perform, of... Dina? Yeah, pardon? Where do you perform? Uh, all, all over Ontario, all really? across, uh, well, basically um, from the east coast of Canada to the west coast of Canada. Wow. And I'm um, just getting ready to do a show in Grand Bend for the Winter Carnival. Great. Mm -hmm. And I just got back from doing shows at the Gravenhurst Opera House and the Sterling Theatre. And um, so I'm just listening to some of the comments that, you you know, different people had to make. And the last gentleman that just made a comment about Robertson Davies saying that, no, uh, nobody should have any funding and that every entertainer should stand on their own merit. Well, I don't receive any funding from any um, government and institution such as, uh, you know, any of the arts councils or any grants. And, um, you know, I've been f performing for 20 years on our own, on my own merit, paying for all my expenses, my road, my advertising, my promotion, my equipment. And uh, this gentleman that made the comment, well, I sort of agree with him, but in a sense I don't agree with his comment because if you take Robertson Davies, I mean, he's a university professor, so in his own sense he was funded because he did have a job working for the university, which allows him the, the, the time to, you know, to write. I mean, like he has a lot of time to to uh, write, and uh, he has the, you know, the backing of uh, his 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 called set. Well, he, he was a, a, an actor and a journalist, but he was also published uh, generally by McClelland and Stewart, who, and they receive government funding, and I have no objection to that publisher receiving government funding. Um, most people who are published in Canada receive some sort of funding through their publisher. I do. I, I still write books, and the publisher is funded, so even though they're not directly to me, there's still money there. And one of the, the, the things is, though, if you, if you write for an American publisher based in, in Canada, then they don't get any funding. 
and they would argue that's unfair because they're publishing as many Canadian books sometimes as the Canadian publishers. Except you can apply for grants in the U.S. There are Ford Foundation grants available to writers, and they're huge. I don't. Th they are. I wasn't about the writers as much as the publishers. No writers. Yeah, but I'm saying the writers. The fact that yeah. the publisher doesn't no, give it to you. The writers can. The writers. Yeah. Any writer can apply. Yeah. But if it's a Random House or cannot for whatever you got. Take another call. Let's go to Jerry on line five. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to talk to you once again. Thank uh, you. Larry, it's a pleasure to see you. I finally called on a phone line and got through to Larry, even though it's not his show. <laughs> I won't <laughs> hang up. Yours. <laughs> Anyways, my comment is I uh, come from uh, northern Ontario when I was little, and uh, I guess uh, somewhere around the 23 mark came to the Toronto area. And a great deal of people, and I'm not sure what the percentage is, so nobody get angry at me, uh, don't really follow arts and museums and whatnot. And the ones that they do in terms of the arts that they do see, as in movies and uh, various things at Stratford, probably wouldn't receive much funding because they make it on their own accord. And it brings me to my point, which the origin of uh, arts in general initially were not uh, something that government would fund uh, throughout the years. And you might have to go way back to the Roman times. Uh, and the involvement of government getting involved in the funding, or so I see it, is uh, nothing more than a clever strategy of uh, passing money to their preferred business associates or uh, long-standing uh, uh, areas. And uh, I would say, you know, I would agree with the Freedom Party leader that uh, if arts are what you're after, uh, you should pay for it as it is your interest. In my case, you know, never going to a museum, and you can call me, you know, uh, uh, un unprivileged in that area or not knowing about art. I, c I can make up for in other mediums like the internet if I really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, are you the leader of the Ontario? Of the I, I'm not. I, I am on the executive, but I'm not the leader. Maybe I have promotion. Wait, they in, have in an the executive. Wings. Yeah. <laughs> How many are there of you? Oh, there's several. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all applying for funding tomorrow. But um, no. Um, he just made the, the comment that government shouldn't be funding. I think it's important to remember that government doesn't fund anything. We fund it mm -hmm. with our money. Uh, government takes it from us when we won't spend it on the arts and spends it on the arts. That's what we're talking about. That, that's why I'm saying. That's why I'm saying that uh, it, it's unfair because I, you know, I never go into a museum, and I'm sure there's a lot of us. And I, I just like to say. Tell me, tell me something for a moment, Jerry. You might not, but do you think Canada? is a more civilized, more livable place because other people do. Well, I, let me finish because I'm going to address okay. that directly. The one, the place like the planetarium, which is very tragic, that uh, they had to cut off a branch of, uh, of, of their existence uh, because government uh, ruined their funding. I guarantee you that if I was exposed to the situation, I could point out how the place would e was either uh, mismanaged from the sense that they didn't bring in uh, some creativity to fill that planetarium up as they used to 90 years ago with the rock shows. And if it wasn't because it was mismanaged, and I'm not suggesting that it was, it was because there might have been some overpayment in terms of uh, chairmans or people that ran it that they didn't uh, uh, change. Things are going um, extinct. Right. There's a know. point about Larry. the planetarium. The planetarium was given to the museum by Sam McLaughlin, the founder of General Motors Canada. Sam McLaughlin had a rather, what to me is an annoying habit, and I don't want to offend people in Oshawa with this. He gave things, but he didn't endow them. And if you give something that costs an awful lot of money to keep up and you don't give an endowment to keep it up, you're giving somebody a millstone to hang around their necks. They can't afford to keep it. And, and it's almost um, axiomatic in giving that it should be given as something that is self-perpetuating. When the Toronto Symphony Orchestra was fighting for money, one of the quotes was made that the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra, which is one of the top three or four symphony orchestras in the world is funded in perpetuity. There is a long-running grant, not just money, but money that keeps coming from the old steel barons of the 19th century. And increasingly, That's museums, galleries, symphonies are seeking endowments, endowments yeah. so that they can be more self-sustaining and can therefore have greater control over their own destiny. Um, when you look specifically at the planetarium, it was in a situation where, yes, indeed, it was a gift, and there was a small endowment that was provided. 
um, to support. To keep it going. No, because it, it didn't cover the operations, but certainly helped cover the the maintenance on the equipment and, and that sort of thing. But when you look at the planetarium in the days where we had 300 people. 300,000 people coming through the door each year down to the more recent years when there was so much more competition for people's leisure time in the city down to say 250,000. Um, we were still ensuring that it was only requiring about 60 percent of its budget to be subsidized. So we had increased its self-sufficiency but not enough to justify keeping it open, and it was a standalone entity. But when you look at the pressure on organizations to change the balance between government funding and self-sufficiency, um, it's a very difficult balance to, to keep, and it's also break. difficult I, to I want to make one comment. I've got a break. Four, they're going to spend four, we'll get, when we get back, 416-203-0302 and 905-332-3131. Bill and Glenn and Tom and Waylon and the rest of you, when we come back, on Michael Corrin Live without any public funding on CTS. Welcome back to Michael Corrin Live on, C on CTS. Larry Solway has to tell us about North Bay. Larry, go for it. Yeah, it's just uh, because the person is from the north, I don't know where in the north, and if you're really from the north, that is Hearst, mm -hmm. North Bay is not the north, but North Bay is the north. North Bay, I don't think has any more, but had a symphony orchestra. North Bay Symphony Orchestra closed for want of $80,000. People were going, but they needed, symphony orchestra is an expensive thing to run. Um, they needed 80,000 bucks, they couldn't get it. And that's the Premier's home riding. Mm -hmm. I don't want to make a political comment. No, make one. No. I mean, that's, um, the Tories hate me enough anyway, so what does it matter? <laughs> Let's go to Bill on line eight. Hi there, Bill. Good evening, how are you tonight? Good, thanks. Good, uh, nice to talk to uh, Larry again and Tom. I come from a community radio background myself here in town, so I know some of the problems that you've been going through, Is that Tom. Bill? Beg your pardon? Bill. Oh, I know, Bill. Yeah, how you doing, Larry? Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted uh, that uh, is very interesting, two points real quick. One is the difference between uh, arts entertainment and arts. And I, and I don't think that's really been addressed. Um, when you, you can have an arts entertainment industry that a lot of people go to, but what about the pure, uh, some of the arts that really don't, have a chance there for the public to see because they've been marginalized and things like that. And that was the other point that I wanted to bring up. Uh, we were talking about getting grants for, uh, you know, if you say you're a lesbian or something else, you can get a grant immediately. Well, one of the things I found in community radio was is that talking uh, to a lot of people in the arts community is, is that those particular communities that are in a minority, that are marginalized, do have a tough time with their arts because it is an arts entertainment industry in many cases. So they, you know, they really do deserve, I think, to have the funding available to. Well, I don't, if anyone said, if you're a lesbian, you get a grant immediately, they're, they're, they're just wrong. That isn't true. The point that I made, and I, w I would continue to make, I, I've seen a lot of uh, supporting material, is that there seems to be a bias uh, for things that you call marginalized. I think, uh, in fact, are very mainstream these days. And if you propose something that seems to have perhaps a, a Christian or a more conservative foundation to it, uh, family-based, you will find generally you're going to get a lot of criticism. Uh, whereas if it comes from more of a, uh, some form of sexuality, particularly a so-called alternative sexuality, it seems to be the cards are in your favor. Now, I actually support in some ways a form of positive discrimination. For example, I, I think people of color have uh, not been able to express their, their cultural side over the years. Maybe they need some help. Native population. That certainly doesn't go uh, for sexual preference. That, that's the point I was making. But what is the difference then, between art and art entertainment? Um, is, is art by its nature to be unentertaining? Well, I think arts entertainment, what I mean by arts entertainment is, 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 a, is an art that's become an entertainment business, as it were. I mean, for, for example, and maybe it's a poor example, but uh, the, uh, the symphony orchestras or, or, or things like that in town that, uh, that do have large subscription bases and, and sell a lot, a lot of tickets, and, as opposed to, say, a small Baroque or orchestra playing out of... Uh, uh, East End Toronto uh, and, and really scraping to, you know, to make it... Different. Isn't it one of achievement? Uh, maybe those people in the small uh, Baroque Orchestra don't want to make it, but I suspect most of them actually do. It's just how far have they got. 
Hamlet uh, with, I think, Paul Gross this year, I'm sure will sell out. You're going to have a hard time explaining to me that Hamlet is not art. Look at Tafel Music. Tafel Music. Exactly. You, you know, it's, Started it's interesting with Krantz, that, little tiny thing, yep. people playing recorders. One thing, we have, one thing we have asked is, we have these so-called marginalized groups. The very process of taking money from the general public and directing it toward uh, whatever they choose to direct it toward helps to marginalize the people who don't receive the money because we, the rest of the ta taxpayers, don't have the money to spend on uh, lesbian art or, or black art or whatever the case may be. And, and I don't think, see, I think the other thing is we get into a real, a real quagmire in justifying uh, government so-called government funding or, or taxing mm -hmm. and spending on the arts when we say, well, it's okay to, to uh, direct funds toward people according to race and sex, but not according to sexual orientation. I, no way I'm going to do that. Well, I mean, obviously, that's, that's your opinion. And no, I, no, that's not what I said, though. I simply believe that a, a gay theater group that uh, couldn't exist probably does deserve to, to have some help. But he's but, in bad times. But a limited number of... When you find that, and this happened with a, a, a municipal funding body, that of 50 grants given, at least half of them were to groups concerned with homosexuality or individuals concerned with that, you think, well, this simply is absurd. Um, I'm saying give people a fair shake. They're not getting that at the moment. But we can have juries of people who are qualified, members of, commu of the community, church groups, published writers, publishers, to sit down together and say, we think this will be... It, it, it's, of course it'll be arbitrary. Of course it will be arbitrary. Samuel Pepys thought that Midsummer Night's Dream was absolute garbage. He was wrong. But he's also a great... You know, but we must make some form of judgment in the end, surely, because otherwise art will, to a large extent, die. I'm not going to trust the dollar. The hooker on the street corner makes money. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean she's doing a noble thing. But nobility is not necessarily judged by uh, a religious doctrine or by morality, even. Even less but so by the dollar. Well, maybe, maybe the dollar is the most moral system. Who why? knows? I'm not going to make the argument. But that's why that you're arguing that it is, but why? I'm saying that it's the only system that allows individuals, independently of their race, religion, sexual orientation, to make choices as to what they think is valuable in their lives, and not to have someone on high take their money away from them and spend it on what when is so for our when own has good. It existed? When has this system existed? Never. You don't believe in business subsidies, then? I think it has. I mean, I'm on your side generally, but no, you don't absolutely. believe in I business No, I would never, subsidies. ever fund a business with tax dollars. So the role Period. of government would be? Uh, to protect our property, our person, and so that's about it. You Privatize the mind, police? You don't mind tax relief nope. for, uh, for hockey boxes, huh? I do mind tax relief for hockey boxes. Oh, okay. He's consistent. You can't get him on that. And, 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 and in terms of police, I think that's a proper function of government. I mean, we give up part of our property, our money, or land, whatever it is, so that we can protect the rest of it, so that we can protect our person, so that we can make sure that the dignity and, and uh, freedom of choice and thought of every individual in society can be protected and preserved without the fear of a fist or muggers or robbers. Now, um, Paul, police, m m police are, are properly paid with that money that we consent to be look, taken Look, muggers can be arrested by police, but you'll create more muggers if, for example, you have a society like the USA where you take welfare away from people. Anyway, we're getting to a different subject there, but we'll come back to that because I love it. 416-203-0302-905-332-3131 on Michael Cora Live on CDS back in just a moment. Welcome back to Michael Curran Live on CTS Arts Funding. Glenn on line three. Hi, Glenn. Oh, hi. Hi. Actually, um, I'm interested in what Larry has to say. I think um, it seems it appears more open-minded. And my point here is that um, I think really? the public is a very diverse and interesting group of people. And I think the fact that they're actually funneled into a, a marketing group, it could be movies, casinos, um, and I think their attitudes will change from one decade to another. And it would be sad that any part could be lost in that change. And I, what I find very interesting is that the groups like the, the gays or the bisexuals or all that sort of stuff, in some ways, that's just another diverse and interesting part. And I don't think we should always put it down. So I think... But then who's... This is the point, this sort of self-proclaimed martyrdom. No one's putting it down. I can, I can take you to theatre group after theatre group and book after book concerning those issues. What I'm saying is... 
Try to write a book defending the family. Try to write a book from a, say, an Orthodox Christian point of view. These are the groups that are marginalized today. Don't buy into this easy propaganda that somehow, oh my gosh, if you're gay, you're in trouble. That simply isn't true. We're all interesting. The great human carnival of types that, that make up Canada, we're all very interesting. But you're, you will find that often grant-giving bodies believe that only certain people are interesting. And that's what I object to, Glenn. Let's go to Tom on line four. Hi there, Tom. Hi. I'm a music student currently attending university. And uh, I find more and more um, ensembles and art galleries or any art group are having to produce more pop, pop culture exhibits, like the big, big attractions or the pop concerts. They're going to have the Titanic music at, uh, at a symphony concert. And I find that takes time away and space away from... Um, new Canadian artists that are want to present their work. Um, there's very few new music ensembles or new music ensembles being given a real stage in Canada because of our our, our cut to cost of of culture. All right, let me, sorry to interrupt, but this is a very good point, Paul. Uh, even if they do make money, it will be playing stuff that maybe caters to, to, to the, the lowest in people. There are great voices out there, great Canadian performers, musicians. They won't get the chance because it's not instantly profitable. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, no business is instantly profitable. I think that's the answer. I mean, I, uh, they usually say three, three years to make a profit, five years to sleep at night, and I think the arts shouldn't be any different. You think the arts should be a business? I think all of life is economic. I, oh. I ran a theater uh, on my own money. And somebody once said to me, you can't be your own Canada Council. My partner and I lost our shirts. I may never recover from my effort to bring good theatre at my expense and my partner's expense mm -hmm. to a group of people living in a small town just outside Toronto. Right. Bad business choice. Oh, it Paul, was, come on, you're an enlightened man. How can you say no, that? I, I, I'm, I'm, it was I'm, good theater, let me tell you. It was, it, I don't doubt it was the best theater. It was theater. very good. But people we didn't want to spend their money on it. But if you do... Does that, but people did. There were people who came. Not enough. Not enough people. I'll tell you, when my partner and I showed up at the National Arts Centre in Ottawa to play three weeks during the summer, one of the plays that appeared there we were on Canada's national stage. Whether you like it or not, we were there. We had quality. We were good performers. Mm -hmm. We deserved better. I took my licking, yeah. and it still hurts. Well, and if my wife is watching, she's saying, oh, men, you, I won't All repeat. Right. I've got it. <laughs> Paul McKeever, thank you very much. You were you, mostly wrong. Tom Fulton, thank you very much. You were, you were right and wrong. Larry Saul, where you were yeah, mostly wrong. Oh, well, and Meg Berkley, well, you were terrific. Uh, tomorrow night, we have uh, kosher sex. Don't ask me, but we'll just have to see what that's all about. And also, we have our political panel. Will the Tories show up? We'll just have to see. Take care. God bless. Goodbye. See you.